Well, I'm Steve Flegel. I'm with the National Weather Service Office in Marquette, Michigan, and I'm going to talk about some of our aviation, experimental aviation grids that we do here at our office. Uh, so we started doing the, the experimental fire weather grids, which featured some of the ceiling and visibility grids back in February of 2002. And uh, it was something that we just kind of set up to kind of see how things were and how they worked. And, and after we kind of saw how things were doing, we, we started to expand on it a little more. Um, but those initial tools that we got uh, for some of the ceiling and visibility grids, uh, we kind of, they took more of a consensus approach on uh, just kind of averaging out like the NAM or the GFS or, or that type of thing. And so um, we kind of expanded it out to take a look at a lot more models across the area and um, both with what we derived from um, model RH or, you know, straight model uh, visibilities or cloud cover or ceiling heights. Um, and this was completely hands off to the forecasters and we just kind of had it run in the background just to see you know, how, how things were doing before we really started to kind of to promote it. But one of the things that we found out as we were, we were, you know, creating them in the background is, you know, it, it ended up having a pretty good handle on, you know, getting a rough idea of when, you know, ceilings would fall or rise or, or same thing with the visibilities. And, you know, especially with the timing factor, maybe wasn't perfect on, on the, you know, the actual visibility values or the ceiling values, but, you know, kind of had that idea of, okay, you know, you, the, the values would fall in, you know, this couple hour period or so. Uh, and then just as another overview, uh, we originally started creating it every 60 or through 60 hours and every three hours in between there, and we just kind of interpolated through. But as we uh, kind of looked at it a little more closely and expanded things out, uh, we've expanded out to seven, through 72 hours, and then uh, the first 12 hours now are, are run hourly using some hourly model and then also interpolation, and then we do every three hours after that through 72 hours and then kind of interpolate in between them. Uh, so within our, our graphical forecast editor or the, the GFE, which we use here at the Weather Service, uh, we added in ceiling and visibility grids to our forecast database, um, and like I mentioned, before there, the ceiling stuff was calculated off of model RH and essentially derived on the fly. So it, it kind of took a toll on on the the computers with the processing on the fly. Uh, so back uh, this past March, at the beginning of March, we ended up changing it to more of a background processing. Uh, so that way, you know, it kind of provided a couple different options. One, so the forecasters could look at each individual model and see what you know, ceiling and visibility data is being shown. And then two, we also adjusted the, the way the calculations were to instead of just being straight RH, we did RH with respect to ice. Um, and then we also converted over some of the visibility grids at that time too. Um, and with that kind of conversion, we enhanced some of the consensus stuff, the, the calculations in the first 12 hours I mentioned, um, both using the hourly model data, like the HRR or the RAP, um, and then also kind of interpolated some of the three or six hour model data like the MAV and the MET or, or GFS, NAM, that type of stuff to get like an hourly model data from them and then incorporate that into the hourly calculations. And then the other thing we did is we added the ability to do some weighting so that way if we were seeing certain models performing better, uh, we could add you know, some weights to them to, to kind of improve the overall forecast. Uh, here's a list of the models included, and I'm not going to kind of go through them, but it gives you kind of a general idea of what we do for, you know, both the ceiling and the visibility. And uh, we kind of use it, you know, as you can see, it's mainly, uh, you know, American uh, models. And then we also add in some of our local uh, war fronts that we do here at the office. Um, and then, unfortunately, due to both GFE and AWIS limitations, we don't or aren't using any of the the Canadian model or the ECMWF and uh, some of the other INSEPT models just be due to the lack of, uh, you know, model data that we get in. Uh, so here's how the forecasters can, can view the data within the, our GFE. Uh, we have a separate subset of aviation um, viewing so we can look at both uh, the kind of the consensus ceiling and visibility data and then also all the individual models. So it makes it real easy to kind of go through and, you know, it, whether or not it's seeing how things are performing in the current time frame or what they're expecting in the in the future. Um, and, and we also kind of set up a, a color table to 
to match our categorical uh, amendment criteria uh, values, which fortunately for us, for all, all three of our task sites are, are the same. So it made it real easy to, um, to you know, have the color table the same for the whole and or for the entire area and um, just kind of a normal um, kind of coloring curve down to where, you know, kind of red or purple ends up being, you know, the worst conditions and then transitions up to, to gray or, or black to, to show the, the improving conditions. Uh, and then we also added the information into Avian FPS, kind of similar to what some of the Eastern Region offices in, in the Weather Service have done uh, to add in the, both the visibility and the ceiling data. And that makes it real easy for the forecasters to be able to see uh, the information kind of in a, you know, a normal place where they would be looking for the, you know, the GFS data or the, the NAM MOS and that. So uh, made it real easy to also to be able to see some of the timing features there where you know, where the, the gridded information is showing, you know, the reduced visibilities or the lower ceiling values. Um, and, you know, overall we had to make a few minor background changes, but we might uh, kind of go with more of a consistency with what some of the other offices are, have been starting to do or have been doing. Uh, so now I'm going to show a couple case studies of, of how the grids have worked out or haven't worked out over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, this first one is from March 2011, or March 11, 2013. Um, we had a low-pressure system moving out of the plains and through the Great Lakes region. Uh, the image here on the on the left-hand side is our snowfall forecast uh, during that period. So, pretty good swath of snow across the central part of Upper Michigan, and influencing one of our task sites, um, Sawyer International Airport, or KSAW, which is located roughly around, around where the pointer is there. And you know, kind of one of our, or pretty much the main airport in in the UP for for traffic for us. So, um, so this is a good case study to kind of show how how the system impacted that site. Uh, so here's some examples. Uh, unfortunately, with the limitations on with um, you know loops and every and animations, just kind of grabbed a couple kind of like snapshots of of how the ceiling and visibility grids looked through this event. This is as the low pressure system is starting to move through Illinois and approach the area. So the visibility grids are kind of highlighting the area where you know some of that um, you know heavier snow was falling, and then um, you also have that with the ceiling grids. And so I'm just going to kind of step through uh, six hours at a time. Now here, six hours later, you know once that low pressure system starting to move into into Lake Michigan, you can see a pretty widespread swath of of moderate to heavy snow across the area and. Anywhere where you're kind of seeing some of those oranges and reds, it's you know generally like a mile and a half or lower, or a mile or lower in the visibilities. And then as we step another six hours, and now it's kind of transitioning as that you know that main swath of precipitation is moving out with the northeast winds across Lake Superior. It's kind of transitioning more to a, a lake effect or lake enhanced event where you're starting to see the the higher visibility or lower visibility values over the higher terrain of of north central Upper Michigan, which is Kind of one of the you know traditional things that we see up here in the with those type of uh, low pressure system tracks. So just a brief bounce out to to verification. Um, these are our critical amendment criteria categories. Uh, I'm not going to go into the you know the real nitty gritty for them, but the main thing is just kind of the highlight the color coding that I've got here because I kind of use it throughout the rest of the slides. Uh, and this is just kind of highlighting our MVFR must file alter, alternate. Um, IFR and then the alternate landing mins and the airfield landing mins. So um, just kind of keep those color schemes, you know, in mind as we kind of go through some of these next couple slides. But the main ones we'll kind of be highlighting is more in the, you know, the blue, yellow, uh, red, and purple colors. So if we take a look at the the verification for this event for the for the Sawyer International Airport um, there in Marquette County, uh, the 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 call or the first grouping here on the left-hand side, that was uh, essentially like a 24-hour forecast or that you know, was using the grids that were created for the, for the March 10th at 6Z TAF forecast. And we've kind of run this every um, couple, of, couple times before each TAF forecast. Will, so we end up running it right around eight times per day. Um, so that way we can kind of you know, get an you know, initial guess there for the forecasters. Um, a couple hours out and then run it right again right before the, the tasks go out just so we get kind of the most recent model data. But the key thing to highlight in, in this first column is we've 
and this is the same all the way through, is we've got the actual METAR observations from Sawyer um, identified with METAR. Here's the ceiling and then the visibility here. And then anything that I've got labeled NDFD, that's essentially our, our local grids here. So uh, the, the key thing to highlight here 24 hours out is, you know, they, especially in the visibility, they had the idea of that alternate landing mins, um, you know, pretty consistently, you know, once we got, you know, out to that 24-hour period. It wasn't, you know, exactly perfect on the timing. Looks like, you know, in this case, the METARs reported the, those visibilities lower. Um, than what the forecast was indicating 24 hours out. But as we start bouncing, you know, go to 12 hour out forecast, you can see that that, that kind of difference or the timing is getting a lot better there between the, between the, you know, the actual METARs and the gridded database. And then when we go to six hours out, you know, it pretty much nailed it, you know, right on the nose for, for that hourly start time. Um, looking at some of the ceiling data, you can kind of see here, uh, looks like it's mainly indicating that alternate landing or must file alternate um, values in our grids, but uh, you know it was more of an IFR alternate landing mins for for the the METAR, and that's kind of one of the biases that we've seen. And I'll kind of go into that a little bit further, where it's, you have a little bit of a high bias in the ceiling grids. So here's another case um, from this past March on March 19th. We had a low pressure system that was that was shifting east out of the Northern Plains and through the Great Lakes region. Uh, and kind of the this one ends up being for our our other one of our other task sites, Houghton County Airport uh, KCMX, which is located on the Keweenaw Peninsula, and that one's uh, you know majority of the time through the winter kind of controlled by lake effect clouds and precipitation. Uh, so one of the key things with this one was just the you know the fact that at you know essentially 24 to 30 hours out, so you know beyond the task period, it pretty much nailed the visibilities going down to your your alternate landing minimums and even had some hints at the airfield landing minimums too. So just having that that information in there is just kind of a you know shown as a, it's a success situation here where, you know, even though it may not have been in the task, it's a real easy way to say, you know, to look at that and be like, hey, you know, maybe put that in the mention in the aviation discussion or, you know, be able to that have that information out there to let people know that it's that it's coming up, and then once again in this case, you know the the ceiling values ended up being a lot a lot lower than what the um, from the METAR than what the, our grids had. And here's another case. Um, this is a shallow moisture case from March of this year too. Uh, we had lake effect clouds uh, and snow showers that had diminished, and with the high pressure moving over the area, we had kind of those that low level moisture trapped over the lake and with light winds under the high pressure, it was kind of at the mercy of where the wind directions were going. Um, so a little difficult to see here, but the clouds are kind of, you know, right in this area here. And this one is going to be for Sawyer again uh, there in, in Marquette County. Uh, this was kind of a, a tough case because the models were really, you know, differing on, on what was happening. So. On the far left-hand side, I've got the wrap, and you can see the wrap is really picking up on that low-level moisture, had a really good handle on it. Um, GFS on its initial conditions is kind of hinting at it, but, you know, not so much, and the NAM didn't have it at all. So, um, unfortunately, with the way the, the aviation grids go, um, there's pretty heavy reliance on on what the models are showing. And, you know, if the models aren't showing it or there's some differences in the models, uh, it can really start to start to struggle. So this was a case where it struggled. Uh, you can see this is the actual um, grid that, or the initial condition grid that it had uh, from the models um, for our aviation grids. And kind of hinted at some MVFR ceilings out over the eastern part of the UP um, and over Lake Superior. But overall, as a whole, it was saying MVFR conditions across the area. And um, so, you know, it kind of definitely was a, a case where it really struggled. And, and, you know, I think a lot of that comes down to with the models kind of differing on, on how much moisture was there in the initial conditions. Um, and looking back at our tasks, too, and, and our discussions, we were kind of struggling on it, too, on how quickly the winds were going to switch from more of a northeasterly direction where it would push those low clouds into the Sawyer um, and then kind of switch to more of an offshore direction and push it out. So the TAFs kind of had the, the right idea, but, you know, they too struggled on, on how quickly that would move out. It, it lingered a lot longer than what, than what we were expecting also. 
Uh, so back in at the beginning of February, we after running this for pretty much a year, we decided you know hey we need to start looking at verification and and getting a better idea of where it's performing well and where it's not. We kind of had some general ideas, but uh, we wanted you know some some t statistics to kind of to verify what we were what we were thinking and and confirm our our thoughts. Uh, so we do have a couple caveats before I show some of the verification data. Um, the local verification of our grids, um, unfortunately, it's not I completely identical to the way our NWS verification goes. Uh, we only looked at the hourly OBS at the top of the hour, and then we also just looked at ceiling height uh, with no restriction by cloud cover, like you know the normal TAF verification is done, is only looking you know at broken. Um, overcast vertical visibility type stuff. So we just looked at ceiling height as a whole. And we also left out one of our sites, Ironwood, Michigan, uh, because it's been pretty much hit or miss on observations. So we, you know, just to simplify it and, and eliminate the need to kind of filter through when it came in and when it didn't, we just kind of left it out. And then one of the things with the NWS verification too is it has, uh, it does five minute uh, calculation that has the specials which we didn't include in the NDFD verification. So they're slightly different, but I think as a whole it can kind of give us a, a general idea. So these next, I guess, four slides that we'll have is just kind of looking at the verification both on the zero to six hour period in the TAF and then the six to 24 hour outlook time uh, time period in the TAF. Um, and all of these are from using all of February and all of March. Uh, and then color scheme is the same on them. The, the blue here on the left-hand side, uh, left-hand bar is our aviation grids or labeled as NDFD. The red is our TAFs. Uh, green is the GFS MOS and then NAM MOS and then GFS LAMP as you go through. So uh, the big thing that kind of sticks out in this case with ceilings and in the percent hit column is, is our TAF forecast, which you know is what we would hope would be the case is, is kind of beating out everything else in those first six or those, especially up here, the kind of the most important uh, times since our, you know, our uh, aviation needs are more in kind of those first couple of hours or um, kind of time period. Um, and then kind of the big thing too with our office and the ceilings is, you know, we're not missing on more than, you know, two categories or more off. Um, we're doing a lot better than all the other model guidance in that case. But if you look over at visibility, um, that's where we start to see some skill um, in our aviation grids. We, you know, our visibility ends up almost matching or a little bit better than what our TAF is doing in the first six hours. And then, you know, pretty much the same way across the board with, you know, being one category off or being two or more categories off. So definitely showing skill over, um, you know, the straight MOS guidance up here. Um, bumping over to for Houghton for the same first six hours. Um, once again, still kind of seeing that similar idea where uh, you know our office tasks are doing better than than the rest of the guidance through for the ceiling values, and you know especially in this case with um, times where the you know the ceiling were two or more categories off, we uh, our tasks were a lot better, and that was one of the struggles with um, our NDFD grids or aviation grids where um, it was you know kind of struggling with that, and I think. Some of that's been improved, or definitely been improved, with our move to our RH with respect to ICE here in the last uh, couple months. Um, but visibility, you know, once again, it's as good, or you know, maybe you know, maybe a little bit better in some cases than than everything else. Uh, especially, you know, our tasks are kind of similar. Uh, when we start seeing things even out is when we move more towards that outlook period or the six to twenty-four hour time forecast. Um, you know, looking at that ceiling, you know, pretty similar across the board with all the guidance. So, you know, not a, you know a significant improvement. The one thing, you know, in this case is is our office ends up doing better with, um, you know, being, uh, you know, missing within one category. Um, you know, so we're you know we're we've got the right idea, but we're, you know we're not you know extremely off, uh, which is you know we're seeing you know kind of where the rest of the guidance is can be. Um, you know, more, two or more categories off a little more often than our, our tasks. But, you know, once again, in, the, in this case, the visibility grids, you know, really are starting to show us some skill where, you know, definitely seeing a lot better than what, you know, the rest of the, you know, MOS guidance or our tasks are doing, um, you know, the rest of the way. And that same, same thing holds true for Houghton where, um, you know, the visibility continues to show skill. And that's kind of something that we had seen 
um, over the first year, and you know that kind of solidifies you know the fact that the ceilings then are have been doing um, performing pretty well and doing better than what than what most of the other uh, guidance is saying. So um, some of the positives that we've seen with the aviation grids is does really well with synoptic systems, uh, especially you know or as long as there's there's model consistency there. If there isn't the model consistency, that's when you can see it start getting shaky, and you know it's kind of the same thing with with some you know our forecast. And um, as I've been mentioning, the visibility is both with uh, you know the actual values and the timing um, really been doing well. And I think a lot of that has to do with you know a lot of it coming from derived data from the models and straight from the models instead of try, trying to calculate it out like we do with the ceiling. Um, but we did do some changes here with that respect to ice to. To improve the ceilings in the lake effect areas, and that especially helped for for Houghton when we made that change. Um, some of the shortcomings that we have with the sh with the aviation grids, um, one of them I already showed that shallow moist layer. Um, you know, models kind of struggle with that, as I showed in that case. And then then we also have kind of some limitations within GFE where we only get data into GFE every 25 millibars. So you know, it's there's a Pretty good potential, or there it could be a potential that those those shallow layers end up getting missed by, you know, by those those values. Um, uh, you know, models kind of struggle with this timing of the lake effect snow and clouds. It always seems like we kind of end it earlier than what it is, and you know, part of that may be biased by the way the models kind of handle that. And then the big thing for us is is trying to get a handle on um, on the low ceilings, and and I think a lot of it. You know, based off of what I've looked at, kind of is due to the way we kind of average everything out. Uh, because if a lot of times they'll be hinting at those lower ceilings, but if you get like one or two models that you know maybe don't have that low ceiling, um, it can just you know blow up the you know the visibility or the ceiling values pretty quickly. Um, you know, an example if we had you know let's say 10 models and nine of them were showing 500 foot, but you get one that's 20,000 feet, it's gonna it's going to shoot up the consensus ceiling up to almost 2,500 feet. So, you know, that's a pretty significant change or jump in the in the values, and you know, kind of in one of the more critical times. Um, and the other thing too is, you know, with um, some of the heavier snow, or especially up here in the winter time, the blowing snow, um, a lot of times you get some vertical visibilities that you know won't be picked up by the ceiling grids because you're calculating more of the ceiling and not based off of what's happening at the surface. So I think that's something that we can um, maybe improve based off of our actual forecast for, for those sites by, you know, like using some tools to adjust the, the ceilings based off of the, you know, if we have heavy snow or, you know, moderate blowing snow or, you know, widespread blowing snow. Um, and then just kind of continue to highlight that, that issue that we have with the lack of lower ceilings. Um, just take a look at the frequency or, you know, how often the METAR values show a certain, um, you know, category and then how often our aviation grids show a category. So we've got um, from left to right VFR, MVFR, and then the must-file alternate IFR, alternate landing mins, and airport landing mins. And so, you know, the big thing that sticks out is in that VFR range where um, the METARs, you know, in this case for Sawyer and, and the first 36 hours um, of the forecast, would show you know about 40% of the time or a little over 40% of the time VFR conditions where our ceiling grids would show a little over 60%. So I think that's kind of the big the big thing is kind of narrowing down and getting into these these lower ceilings because you can see you know IFR and below you know METARs you know show that you know the frequency although you know overall percentage isn't much but I mean there's a huge discrepancy between what we're actually getting with um, than what's actually being reported, um, but if you shift over to visibility, you know, like what I was showing in some of the previous uh, verification, you know, the visibility is it's got a pretty good handle on how things would go throughout. You know, pretty good, um, you know, comparison between them. So I think the visibility is is sitting pretty good. It's you know the ceiling that we need to work on a little bit. And some of that improvement, you know, like I alluded to earlier, mentioned before, is with the Irish with respect to ice, making that change. You know, really seem to show a, a significant improvement in the lower ceilings, uh, especially at at our uh, Houghton site or KCMX. Um, in this case, I just took a look at all the times that the the Houghton site in the um, 
you know, the first 36 hours that we, you know, were doing the forecast, um, how often it had MVFR or lower ceilings, and then took a look at what our aviation grids were, were showing in that case. So during the month of February, when we were doing some of our previous calculations, you know, you can see where you know, you'd, you'd essentially want it to be, you know, closer to or similar to what the METAR, actual METAR values are. But, you know, here in this case, we were getting, you know, you know, 50% of the OBS between, you know, like 2,500 and, and seven 8,000 feet. And, you know, when you have MVFR, you don't really want your ceilings to be coming up that that high. But once we switched over to March, and fortunately in this year with the, with the spring being, you know, kind of a lot cooler and a good majority of our snow fell in February and March and, and actually even into April up here. Um, you know, so we kind of had similar conditions both in February and March. And, that improvement, you know, definitely brought the, you know, the the ceilings in the in the in our aviation grids down to a, at least a, a little more reasonable values and you know a lot less of a high bias than what we had been seeing. So I think that's definitely a, a turn in the right direction and kind of continue to focus on that. So that's going to be our our main thing for what we work on in the in the future is to try and improve that um, during those IFR and lower ceilings conditions. Um, and then also kind of take a look at some summertime convection. Our verification has just been in these, you know, these last couple of months. So it'd be nice, nice and I'd be interested to see how well it performs um, with convective situations. Uh, so probably plan on doing some sort of verification this summer. Um, and then also maybe start to improve some um, influence of our forecast into that, especially if we um, maybe start to create, you know, experimental tasks um, like you know, some of the other offices are doing based off of those grids. Um, and then also if we start putting the information on the web, uh, I think that, you know, being able to have that consistency between our forecast and what the, the ceiling and visibility grids are, are showing would be would be good. Um, and, and I think that the expanding the database to the web is going to probably be one of our first things that we end up doing uh, just based off of some of the feedback that we've gotten from our aviation customers, being able to have that, especially since we only have a, a few TAP sites and then several, you know, several other airports across the area, they seem pretty interested and, and open to, to using some of that data. So here's an example of, of, you know, some of the data that like Jackson, Kentucky, and the Boston office in Charleston, West Virginia do both with forecast graphics and then also using the point and click forecast. Uh, so in conclusion, you know, the big thing um, in this case is you know, the performance of the visibility grids, they, you know, definitely showing a lot of skill and, you know, as good or even a little better than our tasks, um, you know, which is, you know, it's a good confidence builder that, you know, that's definitely going in the right direction, especially with the, the you know, potential that we may be doing visibility grids uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, ceiling grids definitely showing improvement here over the last couple of months with some of the changes, but I think they still need to, need to definitely be worked on a little bit more to, to improve those lower end ceiling values. And overall, I think, you know, definitely a good start. I know I end up using, you know, especially now that I've seen some of the verification, end up using a lot of our uh, experimental group, you know, grids for my TAF preparation, you know, process. And, and, you know, definitely gives you a starting point, especially if you're busy in the real short term, you can, you know, I have a pretty decent confidence on being able to use some of the data in the longer term. I think that is all I have if anyone has any questions. George Isaac here, I have a question. Sure. Um, in your um, um, visibility, you don't mention the visibility reductions in snow. Did you calculate those? Nope, it's all, um, all derived out straight from what the models are showing. Well, what does that mean? Does, that, does the model include visibility reduction in snow? Yep, yep. Okay. And the second question is, uh, uh, you're, you, you suggested you're doing ceiling by, by relative humidity. Mm -hmm. um, the model does more than that, I would assume. You could use a liquid water threshold or a, or a condensed water threshold uh, from most of these models. How come you didn't use it? Um, it's, it's largely due to our, our limitations on what we get into our, our forecast, our GFE forecast system. Um, the data that goes into that is, is a lot more limited than what, you know, we see in AWIPS and what we get from the models. So, so our, my hands are kind of tied based off of, 
off of what we get into into that and um, so that's kind of why we we stuck with the with the relative humidity. Can you give me an idea of what kind of thresholds you use for relative humidity? Um, offhand, we just kind of, especially once we get into respect to ice, uh, just a lot of it kind of had to be tweaked based off a of model. Uh, but usually, we'll use anywhere from, you know, like somewhere in like the 95 to a, you know 105 percent range for for um, RH with respect to ice and. Yeah, it depended. I kind of tweaked it based off of like the NAM tends to to go a lot higher in the in the RH with respect to ice than some of the other models. So I kind of had to tweak it based off of off of those those values. Unfortunately, it wasn't overly scientific, but um, it kind of I just kind of adjusted it to make it more realistic with what um, we kind of see with those um, GFS. Uh, when I use that, it ends up being a little bit lower because it doesn't. Um, go tend to go as high as what like the NAM would end up going, and then just the straight RH um, and those values just kind of used anywhere from uh, in that uh, like 80 to to 90 to a, you know 100 type range there, and the you know that also was adjusted based off of the models you know on on their how at least what I had kind of been verifying or what I've been seeing. Um, for them for up here. So no strict scientific type data there, but I think that's I think that's the big the hold up for for some of the ceiling data is just trying to to maybe come up with a better way or, you know, to be able to to use or get some of that model data, but you know, with our with what we get in in GFE it really kind of holds us back. Okay, thanks. Mhm. Mm Any other questions for Steve? Yeah, this is uh, Brian Moretzky at Eastern Region Headquarters. Hi. Um, quick question. I kind of missed the verification. What what was the NDFD? What were you using as NDFD? Sorry, uh, it, it, our NDFD was just our, our aviation grids. Okay. And kind of so used that as instead of typing out the aviation grids um, okay. each time. But that was just our strict grids from, from within... Uh, Within GFE, and what what I ended up using was um, the those text files that are outputted that are put into the Avian FPS. Um, I have a script that runs that archives those every hour, and then um, we have a person here in the office that's really good with um, Excel, so he wrote up a program where I can kind of you know select time periods, and it'll grab all the METAR and all those um, text files and and grab and create some of that verification for me. So, so the OBS like surfed into NDFD? Is that what you're saying? I, I, what what is NDFD? It's the it's your forecast based yep, off our forecast, forecast aviation grid. Okay, so why was that so different than the models? If you were using, oh, okay, it's, it's why is it so different than the aviation forecast uh, than the TAF forecast? Um, well, the the TAF forecast we're not act, we're not actually using the. Our aviation grids and the TAP forecast. Um, there's a few of us that kind of you will know, we'll use it as time, but it's, we're using it more as a guidance. So we're not actually using the the aviation grids to create the TAFs. And okay. so that's why it's that's why it ends up being different because our TAFs are done separately from what our aviation grids are. Okay. Are. So so then the reverse question: Why are, are why is the aviation grid so much different than the initial models going into them? Um, I guess we'll, more you were kind of looking in like with the with some of those moss guidance and that. Yeah, you had versus yeah. you compared to the moss and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, and I think that's a, largely due to the you know those moss values were just those you know those three runs, whereas with the the aviation grids we're pulling in um, you know some of our local wharf models, um, the straight. Like NAM or GFS models, instead of and in addition to some of the MOS guidance. So um, the fact that you're kind of pulling all of them in there, um, you know, kind of created some of those differences. And I think that's where, especially in the visibility, being able to pull in some of the straight like NAM and our local wharf model visibility data. I think that um, definitely helped out. Um, and because the, what we've seen up here with um, some of the MOS data, um, you know, it, it's very iffy on on lake effect scenarios, and I think that's where um, you know being able to pull in the straight model data where they're picking up on those lake effect bands, um, you know, 
I think that's where the it really helped out the visibility and showed that improvement. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and so I guess second question, kind of related to uh, the previous uh, mm -hmm. question from the uh, from the other person on the phone. Why not? For some of the models, you just get direct, you can directly get some of these fields. Yep. Why not just directly use those fields? Or I, like, am. I am anywhere where we get the like the ceiling grids. Where if it's um, well, you know, the MOS guidance, we you know, of course, use like the uh, you know the predominant height data there. Um, like the HRR, yeah. um, we get the ceiling data from that, so we use that. So. Um, you know, the, anything where we actually get a straight model data, we'll use that, and then to fill in the ones, so like the you know, like the NAM and and the GFS, where we're not getting that that model straight model data, we we derive it out. Okay, okay, that makes sense. I I was confused a little there, but that makes sense. All right, yeah, I probably should have clarified that when I put in the in the model data. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you, Steve. Yep.